welcome to ATP Report. I'm Barry Nussbaum. We are extremely honored to have a very special guest today. We have Dr. Bill Warner, the founder and president of the Center for the Study of Political Islam. As you know from watching American Truth Project for years, we keep asking you to read the Quran, understand Islam, so you know what you're dealing with. Well, Bill Warner is the guy on Islam. He has a number of books out. Uh, I urge you to go to his website. You can order from there. He makes it very simple to understand in English. And he has an abridged Quran, which is fantastic. Um, welcome, Dr. Bill Warner. Let's start with you telling us a little bit about your background and the websites. I know there's two of them that our viewers can go to. Well, I've been a scientist all my life, and so I brought this along with me when I first started reading the doctrine of Islam. After 9-11, I'd already read the Quran and the life of Muhammad, so when I saw the second plane hit the second tower, I said, this is jihad, Islam is here. It was immediately clear to me that I lived in a nation which had been attacked in a major jihad attack and that no one knew what was going on. So I decided what I would do is, as I would make the doctrine of Islam understandable to, as I say, the truck driver and the plumber. And that's what I've done. I've taken the source text from Islam. And by the way, you've mentioned the Quran. There are two other books which we have to use here. The Quran is not enough to learn about Islam. You also need to know the Sirah, the life of Muhammad, and the Hadith, his traditions. And this is fascinating material. So this is the work I do is to, I want people to understand what I do, or I want people to understand what Islam does, and I have a website, politicalislam.com. And by the way, I'm proud to say that I coined the term political Islam because on the day after 9-11, I realized that living in America, there was no sense attacking a religion, but we can attack a political system. And as it turns out, Islam is more of a political doctrine than it is a religious doctrine. Well, let's talk about specifics. I've learned a lot from reading your writings. Um, our audience needs to do the same. Let's give them a brief education in our segments that we're going to do together. And let's start out with, I guess, the idea that Muhammad laid out an outline for war. Muhammad was the greatest warrior who ever lived. No one dies today because of Napoleon, Alexander the Great, or Caesar, but someone died today because of Muhammad. He created a whole new form of war, which I call civilizational war. The man was a military genius. He was able to take everything in a civilization and make it a weapon against the host society. So now we have many Muslims in America and we're seeing that they make their own demands, not what America is, but what they want America to become and what they want America to become as a Sharia state. So he talked about all aspects of life can be mm -hmm. weaponized. Yes. Can you explain that. Well, let's take a fashion item the hijab, the head covering. There's been many people who've hired a Muslim woman to be a sales clerk and didn't know they were a Muslim, but then one day, two weeks after she's got the job, she walks in with a hijab on. And the owner of the shop goes, uh, wait a minute, that's not part of our dress code. She says, I'm a Muslim. It is my religious right to wear this. So we see that Islam can use a simple item like that to Islamicize. Whenever you, I call the hijab, the head covering, the banner of Sharia. And when I see a woman who's a Muslim with a hijab on, I figure, well, she's Sharia compliant. That is, she's really very serious about her religion and her political system. So, as you've said, Muhammad is this great warrior, mm -hmm. maybe the greatest of all time, because people are still fighting and dying to fulfill the prophecies and outline of life that he described a thousand years ago. How is it different from the Bible and the wars that were described in the Bible? There's a huge difference. The battles in the Old Testament, because there are none in the New Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, if we want to use the more proper term, are there as a historical lesson. This happened on this time, and this is what was done. The battles that are in the Quran are prescriptive. That is, you should do this until the end of time. So one is a view in the rearview mirror, and the other is almost the headlights pointing ahead as to where we're going. 
And by the way, there will be war from Islam as long as there's even one unbeliever left on the face of the earth. That is the doctrine of the Quran. So in other words, one is a prescription for what you as a good, devout follower are supposed to do versus Christians and Jews that read historical battles, stories to derive lessons from them, but not tell them how to go out and fight. Exactly. Got it. It's a major difference. So you talk about there's seven verses uh, that are bad news. Right. By the way, that figure is wrong. I gave the speech that way, but there's actually 13 verses. Okay. And, what, and one of the things I do, by the way, with Islamic text is, is I measure them. If this is repeated 13 times, you figure, well, they're serious about that. And they're, they're very simple, that a Muslim is not to have a kafir, a non-Muslim, as a real friend. Now, they can be friendly, but as I say, you, you can just sort out a friend from a friendly person very easily by going to a car lot. As soon as you step onto a car lot, it is my experience, you will soon meet a very friendly person who wants to help please you. He's a car salesman. He is being friendly, but let me tune you into this. He's not your friend. <laughs> I've experienced that, as have all of us. <laughs> yes. But the same is true of Islam. Now, let me say something here. These are my most un some of my most unfavorite verses in the Quran because it breaks my heart that as a person, because of his religion, wants to, s that cannot really be my friend. I find this highly disturbing. Disaster, actually. So what it means is if you meet a Muslim at work, you never really know exactly who he is. Is he just being friendly or is he really your friend? But I will say this, as much as he is actually your friend, he is not a Muslim. In other words, to be a friend to a non-believer is outside the rules. Exactly. Now, of course, they have to do business with them. It doesn't mean they're going to be, it doesn't mean they're going to be mean when they see you but it does mean that they're not, if it comes down to making a choice between Islam and you, the choice is always with Islam. Got it. So are there other verses? You mentioned there's 13 that, uh, the bad news verses, so to speak. Can you outline a few of those? Well, they all say the same thing, basically. Do not take the unbeliever as a friend. Don't even take your parents as friends over the, over the Muslims. So when you become a Muslim, if the rest of your family is not, doesn't join with you, then they're not really your brothers and sisters anymore. Your true brothers and sisters lie within Islam. It's a very divisive subject. Interesting. So let's talk about one of those stipulations, the rules on clothing. What was Muhammad trying to create? Because I don't see Muslim men, at least in American society, dressing any different, but the women are completely different. Well, this business of the hijab is, there's a subtlety to it. There are verses in the Quran which refer to cover, which refer to covering, but they're for Muhammad's wives. This was later adopted to be true of all Muslims. But there are other, there are many Muslim women who do not wear the hijab. But as I say, when I see a woman with a hijab on, I figure she's very serious about what she does. That is, she's really Islamic. Is there a difference between just the hijab and the full burqa? Ah. <sighs> Well, <laughs> the full burqa, let me, by, by the way, the word for it, the face covering is the niqab. The burqa is just one of these manifestations. The burqa is found primarily in Afghanistan, although with many people, the word now means any fully draped woman. And it is a division. It's, you know what it is? It's like a wall between us, this clothing. And that is the part of its purpose is to establish the fact that there is an Islamic society and we're not in that Islamic society. Well, it's clear that it's no different, uh, I suppose, than a uniform that wants you to be identified to others as part of a group that maybe others aren't part of. Is there a deeper meaning to that? Not to my knowledge. It is interesting, by the way, to see that sometimes there are, we've noticed here in Nashville, Tennessee, that there are times in which you find all kinds of women who are obviously Muslim, in say the Target store. And then other, other period of time when they don't appear at all. It's almost like in Macedonia, they, if you become a Muslim and you're a woman, the, he, the mosque will pay you a stipend per month if you will wear the hijab, because this advances the cause of Islam. It makes the countryside or the cityscape more Islamic. And so that appears what its purpose is, is to, it's, 
it's almost like a projection of power. And, and what is the purpose of the covering? Well, the original script is it had something to do with the Muslim women not being bothered when they went out at night to, take, to go to the bathroom. So if they were draped, then they couldn't be identified going to the bathroom. So its purpose, is to, its, its purpose has always been to set this Muslim separate from the non-Muslim. That's really its ultimate purpose. And why are the men not covered? Well, now you've asked a more very interesting question here. You'll discover that by and large, the women are subjugated in Islam. As a matter of fact, I took the Quran and studied it this way. I took all the verses from the Quran that dealt with women, and then I put them out, and then I said, does it make the woman equal to man, superior to man, or inferior to man? Well, it turns out that about 5% of the verses, the woman is exalted because she is the mother. Now, in Islam, the mother is the highest rank that a woman can achieve. About 10 to 12% of these is on judgment day, the woman will be judged according to the merits, just like the husband is joined with her merits. But there's a little secret here. The woman, one of the things she's joined, one of the things she's judged at on judgment day is how well does she obey her husband? In the balance of the verses, the woman is subjugated, and here's an example of that. I'm married for some years, had kids and grandkids, and we had two daughters, and my wife breastfed them. There is a verse in the Quran that says it is the male, the father in the house, who will tell the woman when the child should be weaned from the breast. I was like, what? I would have never thought to tell my wife, you know, it's time to take Susan off the breast. I mean, the idea that a man would tell a woman when to stop breastfeeding a child it was unfathomable to me and yet is there in the Quran. So the women are often subjugated is the other way of answering your question. Got it. Thanks for joining us today on American Truth Project's ATP Report, and a special big thanks for Dr. Bill Warner. Please go to his website, check out his books, and get one of his Qurans so you understand what we're talking about and where the source material comes from. I also want to remind our viewers Take out your cell phones, text the word truth to 88202, 88202. You'll be signed up for our text message service, so you'll never miss a video just like this one. For ATP Report, I'm Barry Newsbaum.